Welcome to the second session of the MOOC on Managing Responsibly. In this session, we will be looking at the first of the three pillars of uh, managing responsibly. Um, we are going to look at ecological sustainability. And as we saw in the first session, uh, the two other pillars are, are responsibility and ethics, and they will be covered in uh, subsequent sessions. So if we look at our scheme, where we are currently in the MOOC, uh, then you see that we're in the second session. Uh, and if we look at the different levels, uh, then we will be talking a bit about individual competencies. We will also look at the organizational level, but we will be mainly talking about uh, system interconnectedness. And the topic of sustainability is particularly suitable for that. So what are the topics that we are going to cover in this session? Uh, first of all, we are going to look at the reasons for uh, why there are so many different definitions of sustainability. And if we've done that, then we can take a look at sustainability as a systemic challenge. Uh, and with that groundwork done, we can move on to look at some of the tools that you can use as a manager uh, for bringing sustainability into your organization. And basically there are two uh, types of tools that you could use. One is outcome-oriented tools, and other tools are more about the process of sustainable development. And given the large number of tools that are out there and are still being developed, uh, it's quite important that you also have some idea about how to choose among all those tools. So that will be the concluding part of this session. But first of all, let's take a look at the question, why are there so many different definitions of sustainability, more particularly ecological sustainability? And we start with the observation that ecological sustainability is not a neutral state of affairs, and ecological problems also are not neutral states of affairs. Instead, they are constituted by, first of all, the available information that we have about the state of the world, and the state of the ecosystems of the Earth. And secondly, uh, problems are constituted by the value positions that people have uh, in relation to the information about the ecosystems. So we have information, which is not complete, uh, and also we assess the information according to different value positions. And this makes a problem into almost a unique, you could say almost a unique configuration. And over time, societies, groups of people, uh, develop different uh, definitions of uh, ecological problems. And to bring home this point, you, we can do a very simple exercise. And the exercise is to look at the picture that you see on this uh, slide and pause the uh, presentation for maybe three minutes and look at the uh, picture and simply write down what you see. So there's no theory or overthinking that you need to do. Just look at the picture and write down what you see. Based on historical research, I have uh, made uh, sort of description, virtual descriptions, you could say, of what a person in certain uh, times would come up with if they would be looking at this picture. So this is not actual statements of uh, people living in these times, uh, but it's what I made up based on research uh, that historians have done on, uh, on pollution and in industrial development. So if we would go to the 1960s and ask somebody to look at the picture and state what they see, they would very likely talk about air emissions. And they would also note that the smokestacks are very close to uh, what appears to be uh, like places where people live. And they would see that as a health danger, most probably. At the same time, they would also see the smokestacks as a signal of economic growth. Uh, an economic growth that has a lot of positive uh, um, uh, associations, but also it has negative external effects. So that's the, uh, the air pollution that is a result also of the, uh, of the economic growth. Uh, and these external effects, they need some kind of amendment. Uh, and in the 1960s, people would then, uh, uh, I would estimate, uh, very quickly start talking about a government being responsible for somehow doing that. 
and regulation would most probably be seen as a very efficient way of dealing with those kind of external effects. If we would go back 100 years to 1860, uh, then somebody looking at this picture, black and white at that moment, I think, um, and they would see economic prosperity. Uh, if industrial development, a factory uh, would come to your town, then it would mean that uh, people would have work. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's really very important uh, in terms of bringing financial means into, uh, into, in, uh, into the, uh, the city. Um, and in that sense, the smokestacks are almost seen as a signal of pro uh, progress, and you can be proud uh, of them. At the same time, the smoke also brings a lot of problems, breathing problems, but also the ashes that come out of the smokestacks, uh, soiling clothes and uh, uh, soiling buildings also. And finally, um, the smokestacks and the smoke that comes out of them would also be seen as a signal of the fact that the process, the production process, is inefficient because if it would be completely efficient, then there would not be any waste. So in that case, there would not be smoke coming out of the smokestacks. So you can look at this as an engineering problem. You know, the process is not totally efficient and what can you do in terms of sort of tinkering with that process to make it more efficient. So if we make a big jump again in time and we go to 1995, um, then people would again look and talk differently ab uh, about this picture. Uh, and they would very likely uh, talk about the responsibility of business to deal with, uh, um, uh, with the, the smoke that is coming out of the smokestacks. And very interestingly, they would not only see it as a problem for those businesses, but they would also see it as a potential opportunity. Um, it would be an opportunity to maybe uh, uh, redevelop the process or maybe redevelop products and sell those products as eco products to more discerning consumers. Um, and they would also look at it in terms of resource efficiency. So if you can make your process more resource efficient, you need less inputs, which means that you can produce cheaper. And finally, in, the 1990, uh, in 1995, people would also uh, perhaps look at this in terms of uh, a byproduct that uh, could be uh, used by another firm uh, as an input for their production process. So waste in, the 19, in 1995 uh, also becomes uh, a potential uh, uh, exchange product, you could say, between firms. And then finally, if we go to 2005, uh, people would, I think, talk about this in terms of the emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, and maybe they would think about a solution in terms of carbon credits. So here the smoke is not so much air pollution, uh, which is a local problem, but it's a global problem, uh, the problem of uh, climate change, global warming. Um, and that would also bring with it uh, the controversy, because some people uh, would challenge uh, you and say, well, this isn't, uh, climate change is a naturally occurring phenomenon, so this is not human-made at all. Um, so that would be a likely discussion that you could enter into in, in 2005, if you look at this picture. So, <coughs> so what we see here is uh, that uh, th with the same picture, if we sort of imagine ourselves meeting people in different periods, uh, um, that they would talk about this picture in very different terms. And basically that is one example uh, uh, or a manifestation of the fact that people sort of define problems and the same situation in very different ways, depending on the context where they come from and the time in which they live. And that is one of the reasons why we have so many different definitions of sustainability. And this is also the reason why it's futile, uh, you could say, to try and uh, arrive at one definition of sustainability because we will never achieve that. Um, so later on we will talk a little bit about uh, what is actually the potential of this diversity rather than seeing the diversity as a problem. Uh, to close off this section, 
I want to share with you briefly one uh, view or definition of sustainability that's currently quite dominant, and that's the view of uh, ecological sustainability in terms of planetary boundaries. The planetary boundary uh, concept is uh, the idea that we live on a planet which has limits, and these limits can somehow be quantified in terms of being more or less urgent. So this picture, and you can look at the literature that uh, for which we will give you suggestions, um, you can look at it and you can sort of see um, what those dimensions are on which there are limits, and also the available knowledge uh, about the extent to which we are reaching those limits. And for some of the boundaries, that's really clear. And for other boundaries, we simply do not have enough information. So in that sense, it's uh, a good uh, tool because it also shows that for some of the problems or potential problems, we simply don't have the information at this moment. So now we have looked at uh, one important reason uh, for the fact that there are so many different definitions of sustainability. Um, now we're going to look at a topic that is, I mean, it's different, but it's also about the same question, you could say. Uh, and the topic is sustainability as a systemic challenge. And <coughs> systems thinking is a very powerful way of looking at the world. And it's a very abstract way, you could say, uh, but it's used by people in all kinds of disciplines, scientific disciplines, uh, to analyze the world and think about strategies to achieve things in the world. And the system very simply is a set of elements and the relations uh, between those elements. So if we look at molecules, then they are made up of atoms which are connected or hold each other together in one way or another. Uh, we can look at a product and we can look at the different components that make up the product. Uh, we can look at a text and we can see that it's made up of words that are connect connected into sentences the sentences into paragraphs and the paragraphs into a, in, into a text, a story or an article. Uh, we can also look at people and the relationships with people build societies, social groups. Uh, or we could look at firms and the connection between firms and to customers uh, creating product chains. So the systemic perspective is very powerful in the sense that we can look almost at anything in terms of it being constituted by elements which are connected to each other. And we can use that language of systems to sort of understand one system by also understanding another system. And I've made a little animation. Uh, and uh, this animation uh, you can see as uh, uh, one way of visualizing uh, the fact that you as an individual are part of many different systems. You are part of a family, uh, you work in a firm or in another organization, uh, you live in a city, you work maybe in another city, uh, which is part of a country, uh, which is part of a global society. Um, and this picture sort of shows, first of all, it shows that there are many systems of which you are part. And they sort of fit together, almost like these Russian uh, uh, dolls that are nested into one each other. Um, this animation also shows that you can draw system boundaries in, in many different ways. And depending on what system you think is important, your definition of what ecological sustainability is or should be will differ. So the ecological sustainability of a firm is a very different uh, uh, thing from the sustainability of a city. So let me show you a couple of uh, system boundaries that people have drawn and which have proven to be quite powerful. Uh, the first system boundary is the boundary around a regional cluster. And this specific uh, picture is taken from uh, a Danish town in Kallenburg uh, where firms over a period of, of tens uh, or decades uh, have um, uh, started to connect to each other, exchanging waste streams, uh, sharing utilities. Um, and it's not 
a collection of individual firms operating autonomously, but through the connections and through the, the social relationships that, uh, that come together with that, they have built a larger regional system. And we can talk about the sustainability of the individual components, the firms, but it makes much more sense to talk about the sustainability of the system as a whole. And maybe, and that's one of the uh, things we have found in the literature, uh, in, or what we find in the literature, is that um, uh, people across the world are trying to emulate this kind of regional system. So we see these little Gallenborgs uh, popping up in China, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, this is a very powerful idea where the system boundary is around the regional cluster. Another very important system boundary is that of the city. And here we don't look so much at industrial production or even production and consumption, but we look at the system as a complete system. Uh, at the city as a complete system. So in this case we look at the city as a complete system. Uh, and in the city we have of course industrial production, but we also have transport, we have energy production, uh, we have cultural activities. And each of those activities uh, is connected to each other. And we can try to improve that system and the sustainability of the system by thinking about how we could improve those connections. So how can we use the waste that comes out of households as an input for some kind of energy, uh, biogas, that can then be used in the public transport system? So then we are connecting different parts that are uh, occurring in the city uh, and we make the system as a whole more sustainable. And finally, of course, the earth is a system. Uh, and that's the most encompassing system that we can think about before we actually look at the whole universe. Uh, and for many practical uh, reasons, the Earth as a system is a bit too big to think about, uh, you could say. Uh, but even, you know, at that level, we can sort of have very practical uh, ideas and concepts uh, because you can look, for instance, at trade streams and material flows of a certain substance. And in this slide, you see the trade flows of primary wood. Uh, and you can see where the wood originates, where it goes, how it, between what countries or what areas of the world it is traded. And again, you can ask questions about that. Is this the most sustainable way in which we can sort of uh, produce and make use of wood? So do we produce it in one country and then move it to another country and use it there? or is it much better to produce it locally? So those kind of questions come into sight when we look at the Earth as a system. So the lesson to learn here is that systems are always defined by the observer. They are not out there. They are instead created by the person who is analyzing the world uh, they are looking at. And this means that uh, you have to be aware that whatever you are doing, you're always making some kind of a system boundary. Whatever analysis of a problem you make, you draw a system boundary. So it's useful to think about, okay, what is the system boundary that I have drawn when I was defining this problem? When you're dealing with other people, it's very useful to think about the system boundaries that they, that they are using. Because if you think about the regional system and the people across the table are thinking about their individual firm, and it will be very difficult to come to some kind of an agreement. So then you need to align in one way or another your system boundaries. And finally, it's always very useful if you can sort of see your own system boundary and sort of make it a little bit larger and encompass a little bit more into it. So if you think in terms of the firm, try and th also think a little bit in terms of the regional system. And if you think in terms of a regional system, try to uh, enlarge that uh, to include parts of the, the city, for instance. And if you are able to do that, then you will be able to uh, find solutions that are otherwise not available. One very encompassing definition of the system, the relevant system for sustainability, is provided by the Brundtland uh, report. 
Uh, and this is sort of, you know, when people go back to one definition of sustainable development, then this is the definition that they always end up with. Sustainable development is development that meets the, the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is about development. Uh, it's about development in the present, which also uh, uh, takes into account what, what is possible in the future. And it talks about future generations and their needs. So it also talks about human beings in the present, present and in the future. And the concept of sustainable development, you could say it originates in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in forestry, uh, where uh, at some point people thought, okay, how much can we harvest from the forest before the forest itself collapses? Uh, so how can we draw from the forest what we need and still uh, let the forest grow so we can sort of uh, go back to it and harvest there, uh, you know, as long as we want. And from that, the concept of a sustainable yield was developed. Uh, so the concept of sustainability itself, it denotes a particular way of looking at the relationship between nature and human beings. So sustainable development, as much as we talk about nature and ecology, etc., etc., it is really centered around human beings because it's centered around the fact that we want to continue to live on the, on the earth, uh, we want our children to live on the earth, and we have needs and these needs need to be satisfied. So that's sort of the system boundary or part of the system boundary that's uh, sort of implicit in the, the definition of sustainable development. So again, you know, a definition automatically uh, it means that you have a system boundary. And uh, the Brundtland uh, definition has mm. been uh, captured in, in, in a lot of different ways. And several uh, of these ways uh, make uh, use of, of like the three spheres or the three pillars or whatever. Uh, and they talk about the fact that sustainable development has an economic dimension, an ecological dimension and a social dimension. So, with all this, this groundwork done, we can uh, take a look at uh, the tools that you could use as a manager for bringing sustainability into your organization, or if you want to uh, sort of start developing your organization in a sustainable way. Um, and as I said in the introduction, there's two types of tools. Some tools focus mainly on the outcome, what uh, what is, to what extent is your organization, your city, uh, your country sustainable? And other tools focus more on the process. So how are we going to move towards a situation of sustainability? So we first look at tools that, uh, are, uh, that focus on uh, the outcome. And the first tool is ecological footprinting. And what you see on the slide is uh, um, on, the, uh, on the bottom axis you see uh, countries and then uh, uh, for each country you see a profile you could say uh, and the profile uh, it shows the impact that human beings have on the environment and this profile is defined in terms of the sum of all the cropland, grazing land, forest and fishing grounds that are required to produce the food for these people um, to uh, produce the materials that they use and the energy that they need. And it also captures uh, all the space that is needed for, uh, for storing the waste that they produce. So in that sense, it's really a footprint in the sense of, okay, given what you are doing, this is sort of the imprint that you make on the earth and on the earth ecosystems. So this is really showing the outcome of all the activities of people. And you can simply look up your country uh, and you can sort of say, okay, we're not doing too bad or maybe you are doing really bad. Uh, and based on that information, you can start to uh, de make decisions about where you could uh, uh, possibly find improvements uh, for the current situation. So that's the basic idea of outcome oriented tools. Uh, you have some way of calculating your impact on the environment and that gives you quite detailed information on where you could find improvements. 
Another way of doing that uh, is to look at ecosystem services. And this, is a, th this starts more from the ecosystem, from the natural ecosystem itself, you could say. Uh, and basically what you do here is that you uh, look at an ecosystem and you think about what are the services that this ecosystem provides to society. And there are different categories. Uh, and they have been summarized in, uh, in a number of functions. Um, and basically you can look at the ecosystem and you can say, uh, okay, the ecosystem provides uh, uh, materials, resources, uh, but it also provides like an opportunity for leisure. Uh, there is beauty which is uh, valued by people. Uh, they, they enjoy that, so we also need to take that into account. Uh, and the ecosystem services approach uh, tries to also put a monetary value on those uh, uh, services, which basically gives you one way of uh, comparing those services and maybe saying, okay, you know, we know that this nature area is, uh, has a high uh, touristic value, uh, but it also provides resources uh, and the resources are more important currently for our uh, uh, society than, um, uh, than, than another function. So you can make trade-offs uh, between uh, those functions using this kind of a tool. Another outcome-oriented tool is life cycle assessment. This is probably a bit closer to, uh, uh, to, to, to many people who are working in companies. Uh, what you do with life cycle assessment is that you make an assessment of the environmental impacts of a product. Um, I won't go into details like uh, uh, just as I won't do that with all the other tools. Uh, in the information accompanying uh, this session, you will find sort of references for the literature when you, where you can uh, take a closer look. Uh, so I'm only talking about the basics here. And the basics of life cycle assessment is that a product goes through a life cycle from the extraction of raw materials to production of intermediate products, the final product, consumption and then the after consumption phase uh, where the waste needs to be collected is maybe recycled uh, or the product itself is reused and then finally there's the disposal of the waste that results and each of those steps has an environmental impact and this type of tool is very interesting uh, because you can basically see where the uh, majority of your impact of the product is occurring because in some cases that's the extraction of raw materials. Uh, but in other cases, it's in the consumption phase. So it's not so much in producing the product that you generate environmental impact, but when people are using it, for instance, electrical devices, uh, you're using electricity all the time. Uh, so that is a, uh, a big environmental impact. In other cases, it's the transport between the different steps uh, in the product life cycle. So depending on the product, you have a different profile and you can also see where are the areas of improvement. So now let's take a look at process-based tools. And these tools are not so useful for actually assessing or they, they don't focus on, uh, on assessing the impact of your product or your activities, uh, but they are more about how, what are ways of actually assessing that impact and how can you uh, assess that impact in such a way that it actually makes a difference and that it becomes integrated into the routines and processes of your organization. So a first important tool for that is an environmental management system. And the environmental management system, uh, again, you can find a lot of information uh, about that uh, pretty quickly, so I won't go into that uh, in, this, uh, um, in this session in detail. Um, but there's ISO standards around that. Uh, there's also alternative standards if you're interested in it. Uh, an environmental management system is basically uh, a, a, a way of applying the, the, the thinking about uh, quality improvement specifically to uh, environmental issues. So it's um, a cycle where you uh, set goals, you plan your activities, you execute those activities, and then you evaluate the results. 
And the environmental management system doesn't give you goals, you have to define them yourself. It just gives you a procedure for achieving those goals and evaluating them. Another process-based uh, tool is whole systems analysis. And this is a tool that is much closer to uh, what we were talking about uh, previously, uh, thinking about the world around you in terms of the system. Uh, and this approach, it focuses on uh, assessing the socio-technical system of which you are a part. Uh, and it makes you aware of the system boundaries that you are drawing and that other people are drawing. Um, and a very important dimension of uh, uh, this type of work is that the system of which you are a part is in fact made up of other people. So you need to think about how you can involve those other people. So if you are a firm making a product, you are connected to your suppliers and they have suppliers themselves uh, and they function in a context where they have like governmental regulations, they have maybe NGOs that, uh, that they are in contact with. So there is a very uh, sort of uh, large context in which you function uh, as a firm or as a manager. Um, and changing the system means that you somehow connect to all these different uh, uh, persons and the organizations that they stand for. And whole systems analysis is one approach for actually doing that. And as this picture shows, uh, this flow chart, um, it's, uh, you could say, sort of an iterative process where you think about the system, so that's reflection, uh, and then based on that reflection, you make decisions about, okay, if this is my system, if this, these are the, the goals that I think are important, and this is the system boundary that I think is relevant, then these are things that I can do. And then based on that, you can define projects that you can execute, and then you can uh, sort of use the results and the information about the results as the input for, an other, uh, for uh, a next step of reflection. So a third and final tool um, that you may have heard about in relation to sustainable development is stakeholder dialogue. And stakeholder dialogue, I mean, it can be part of the whole systems uh, analysis um, because it focuses even more exclusively on the fact that the system that you are part of in the end, uh, you know, it's a system, uh, it's a human system, and it's a social system. So basically, stakeholder dialogue uh, provides you with a lot of techniques um, that help you uh, to connect with uh, the people in your supply chain, in your local or regional context, um, in, uh, in the global production chain, uh, you know, sort of making the connections and having a dialogue which stands for actually listening to the other person without judging them first. Uh, if you want to find out about the system boundaries that other people have, then the main thing to do is to not talk yourself, but let the other person talk. Uh, so that's my one sentence summary of uh, all the techniques and tools that you can learn if you uh, 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 look into stakeholder dialogue. And again, there's more information uh, that we provide uh, where you can actually get into that if you want to. So I want to conclude this session with uh, some important information you could say uh, about how to choose among all these tools. Uh, because I have presented six tools or groups of tools even you could say, there are many more different tools that you could find. And if you listen to consultants, if you look into uh, the courses and trainings uh, uh, that you can uh, follow, um, then you will find that there's that it's too much. You cannot do everything. Uh, but it is important that you have some kind of an idea of how to choose among uh, uh, all those different tools. And the way I look at it, and the way I think uh, it's, it's important to look at this is to balance the focus on outcome with uh, a focus on process. So you need to have tools that uh, can 
or you need to combine tools that can do both of these things. Um, and outcome-based tools are really very powerful. They are powerful in communicating where you stand. Uh, they are also powerful in pointing out what are possible targets. Uh, so in that sense, they are really very uh, clear and unambiguous. Um, and especially within your firm, uh, it's possible to compare, for instance, an existing product with a, with a new product. And that comparison can be very helpful if you want to introduce a new impact. Outcome-based tools also have problems. Uh, so if you have that very useful debate within the firm and you take that outside the firm, then it becomes a public debate. And then you can very quickly get into problems because people will do uh, maybe another LCA, another uh, ecological footprinting uh, study with slightly different assumptions uh, and they have a different result. And then you get an endless debate on what are the right assumptions for uh, doing a study like that. And that's, I would say, losing a lot of time and energy that is better spent elsewhere. Um, so outcome to tools are very important and useful, uh, but it's very important that you also engage with the people around you uh, in such a way uh, that you don't get into this uh, uh, conflict state where you're sort of uh, uh, throwing studies at, uh, at each other. And for that, you need process-based tools. Uh, and on the other hand, if you would only focus on the process-based tools, then uh, you would be lacking some kind of a vision and some kind of a guidance of where you want to go. So in that sense, process tools without this information about what your impact actually is and where is sort of the, the greatest leverage for improving uh, your, uh, your situation in terms of ecological impact, you know, in that sense, uh, outcome tools are really very important. So a choice, I cannot give you advice for your particular situation, uh, but if you want to make a choice or you need to make a choice, then it's very wise, I would say, to find some kind of a combination between outcome-oriented and uh, process-oriented tools. So this concludes uh, the session on uh, ecological sustainability. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we first uh, discussed uh, why there are so many diff different definitions of sustainability. Uh, and then we looked at the systemic uh, quality of uh, sustainable development. Uh, and then we moved into uh, a discussion of uh, different tools that you could use within your organization to improve its sustainability. Uh, and we closed off with um, some tips on how to choose among all those tools. And of course, based on this session, you cannot suddenly sort of uh, make a quantum leap in improving the sustainability of your organization. It's not going to work like that. Uh, but it's a useful starting point. And I also think that uh, if you digest the material that, uh, that I've presented to you, uh, then you can start connecting uh, with your fellow students within, uh, that also are uh, participating in the MOOC, uh, with colleagues within your firm, your organization, and beyond the boundaries of your organization, and try to bring in some of the information uh, that is captured in this session. And if you start doing that, then you will notice that you will also uh, be able to make some progress uh, in improving your, uh, the sustainability of your organization. Thank you for your attention.